everyone, and welcome back to FanCast. It's Margaret Wallace Duffy and my sidekick here, Megan. <laughs> we are so excited, um, and welcome back to this really incredible episode with Mandy Dickey, board certified nurse practitioner from the Minnesota area. We're talking today all about brain injury, traumatic brain injury, and her experience first as a, a nurse practitioner specializing in neurology, then sustaining a brain injury herself. And You've really tugged on her heartstrings um, already, Mandy, with your story and your your resilience and your dedication. I think it would be really helpful for the viewers to to really understand, you know, a little bit more about the brain. <laughs> you know, what does it mean, this thing called neuroplasticity? You talk about how you're still working at, at getting back, cognition back and fatigue and all of the things. So this brain is an incredible thing, and I know we're learning about it all the time. Can you tell our, our viewers a little bit about the brain and why this roller coaster that you're experiencing because of the brain itself being um, having the ability to be neuroplastic but that it can take time yeah so I think first off with when a brain injury occurs there are multiple things that happen there's a chemical reaction that literally changes the chemistry of your brain which is why some people have the anger that I was talking about or the personality changes because of those those chemical changes the other thing that happens is we often use the term a shearing force. So your brain shears on the inside of the skull. And it's almost, I always thought about it like a bruise on the brain. So when you have this concussion, you get this bruise on your brain and you actually don't have to hit your head in order to get a concussion. If you get hit hard enough in the chest that makes your brain move around inside of your skull, you still have that same shearing force. The other thing that I didn't really think about because I completely forgot about it again with the accident was that when that when that injury occurs, we have little neurons that, that carry information from one part of our brain to another. And those neurons get stretched and they break. So we literally have to create new highways to get there. So think about when they're doing all this road construction everywhere all summer long, right? Minnesota, we have two seasons, winter and road construction. <laughs> so creating these new roads all the time. In our brain, we have to create those new pathways. And that's what neuroplasticity is, is we're creating these new pathways. So when I mentioned that my my memories were gone and I couldn't access things, it's because literally the brain, the bridge between those neurons had broken and I needed to recreate those. So it was all of the the, the therapies, the, the traditional therapies, the complementary therapies, everything that got those roads rebuilt and, and continue to rebuild those roads. So they're not done yet and it takes a really long time to do that. Unfortunately, the injury happens really quickly. The recovery can take a really long time. When I was taking care of patients, I would see people, some people would get better in a matter of days, some was weeks, months, years, and then there was a small period of people that didn't get better at all. And that's just kind of what they became. The longer my recovery went on, the more I started worrying that I was that last part, because when you're a provider, you know too much. Yeah, so then absolutely. I started worrying that that's where I was going. Yes. I, I love the analogy you give because you really make it understandable and I think that people need to understand what is going on in there because I do believe by educating you empower people to take control and take some control back in their health can you tell the story about the day and you you we talked about this I don't remember if it was actually on your podcast or just in one of our conversations about the day where your neurologist looked at you and said there's not much more we can do what did that feel like and then the most important thing now what because you've seen gains since. So what did that feel like and what are you doing? Yeah, there was about that six month mark that um, I had been doing physical therapy, occupational therapy. He didn't think I was I was severe enough to meet, need speech therapy at that point. So he hadn't gone there quite yet, but he was like, eh, I don't really, I don't really think because I wasn't able to articulate what I needed well at that point either. So he didn't know what I needed because he couldn't tell. And to the average person, I don't look like I have a lot of issues. So it was, that was a, a kind of a barrier in itself because brain injury is a silent injury. People don't see mm -hmm. it. Nobody could see the bruise on my brain. Nobody could see the damage that had happened. And when I was around other people, I expended so much energy trying to make myself look normal that they didn't always see it. So if I didn't tell people I had an issue, they didn't know. So when he told me that we had kind of gotten to the end, he was like, I don't know what else we can do. We, we've, we've pretty much tried everything. Um, he said, well, we've, I, at that point, I got the, the idea about doing other things. And I, I suggested, is there anything else I can do? Can we look elsewhere? And he said, well, we've done everything inside the box. Let's look outside the box now. 
meaning that traditional medicine box, right? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you for, I've listened to podcasts for years, probably a decade or more. And I've heard about red light therapy. I've heard about all these other, other tr treatments that are possible, but I never had access to them. And when the injury happened, I couldn't remember all the things that I'd heard. So I didn't even know they were out there until Dr. Sinekropi reached out to me. So you've had him on your show. Yes. He's been on my show. He was my boss. <laughs> he hired me at the Spine and Brain Institute and he headed up Hypercharge Clinic. And once they got it going and up and running, he called, we talked and he said, when you need to get in here, you need to get treated because you, we need to get you back on the team. And it was that opportunity that I thought, you know what, here's my opportunity. I'm not going to waste this. Let's, let's do it. When I'm in, I'm all in. So whatever three, treatment therapy it is that I'm trying, I'm trying it 100%. So he told me he wanted to be there three days a week. I was there three days a week. Amazing. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Yes. And shout out to Dr. Sinekropi because we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't for him. Um, I was an honor to be on his podcast as well. And, you know, when you think about the brain in that manner, and as you said, thinking outside the box, and you and I both talked about this, this whole movement of preventative and integrative health is about actually just getting rid of the box, in my opinion. Like, why are we in boxes or silos? It is so long overdue that healthcare, those silos are broken down and that we're working better together. Everybody has their specialty, but if we break down those silos and we start linking arms and layering the tools, change happens. And that's what you started to see once you started to layer those tools, um, which we're going to get into in the, in the next segment. We're going to really talk about like, what are those tools? What did that do for your mental health and your, your, the hopefulness of prognosis and recovery as a, as a patient when you finally started to realize, oh, wait a minute, there's a life preserver. Maybe there's something to help. You know, from day one, when I sat in the, in the chair and had the, the photobiomodulation, the structured water, the, the PEMF mat, all of those started clearing away some of the, the fog that I'd had for six months. And I walked away from that with a, a decreased headache with the ability to tell my friends what I had done in clinic that day. And that was huge because I couldn't remember from my clinic appointments to home to tell my husband what I was, what was going on, much less wait hours to tell somebody over the phone what I had done. That day, I thought, you know what, if this is placebo, that's great. I will take it because I needed that win. But I never went back to what I was the day before. It just kept getting better from there. And I needed, I so badly needed that, that glimmer of hope because I was – pretty much in the depths of despair up to that point. Cause I thought my career was gone. My family was forever going to be changed. I was never going to be able to contribute anything anymore. And I pretty much thought I was useless. So knowing that I was useful and this was going to get better and there was hope and there was light at the end of the tunnel. I needed that so badly. I, I, I'd like to just ask you a quick question. So after you've come to the end of your road with your, um, I'm going to use Western physician for lack of a better, better term. Um, you've come to that end of the road, you go and, you know, take matters into your own hands, basically investigate other uh, complementary ways you could try and help yourself. Did you go back and have a conversation with that Western physician and say, hey, this is what happened and this is what I did and I'm only telling you because when you get to the end of the road with someone else, it would be wonderful if you could advocate for them and, and suggest that perhaps they try some complementary therapies as well. Absolutely. I did. I, I haven't stopped seeing him. And he, well, he was a friend of mine as well. I worked with him before in, in our neurology group. Um, so I knew him personally. I knew him as a friend and then he was my practitioner. And I've gone back to him with everything that I've done. And when I went back that first day and told him how I, how I had been changed immediately, he started looking it up. He pulled it up so that he could do research on the clinic himself because he wanted to know more about it. And every therapy that's come along since then, I've had a conversation with him and he's always excited to hear it because he is open-minded. He just didn't know that all of these things were They don't know there. what they exactly. don't know. So, um, that's so good to hear. We'll get there. Mm. I, as soon as I uh, got off the a call with, with Mark about that one too, I sent him a link. I'm like, you need to look this up because I think this could not only help me, but other people. And he's reached out to me since then asking me where I went to do different therapies because he had patients that he wanted to send there too. But this is, this is amazing because it's, there's physicians like Dr. Sinekropi, there's physicians like your doctor who, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't real, know his name, but, um, but these people are going to be leading the charge yes. because there's no ego there. It's, it's not, th they, they, people have to know that there's a scope that they know. And outside of that scope, there's things they don't know. And there's no shame in not knowing about that. And um, 
Right. You know, and, and they, they really coming from a place of advocating for a patient, whether or not you can do your methods help them or not, it's, it's all about helping and supporting them whatever way that happens. Well, in the short time that we've known one another and Dr. Sinecrope, we, we're all, and this is what I've done my whole career and I love, we all learn from one another with one common vision in mind, and that is to improve the health and well-being of the people that we're collectively treating. And that's really what it's all about. So thank you for being that advocate, even while you're struggling to go back to the conventionally trained doctor, which it's not, you're right, Megan, it's not their fault. That's not their training. We're not, yeah. we're not casting, you never know, casting doubt, never, never doubt coming down on them. For yeah. sure. Yeah. However, being open. And I think that is your message, Mandy, mm -hmm. is, is an, really asking conventional trained healthcare professionals to be open to the possibilities of other things that might help. I know that's one of your messages, is it not? It is. Um, we need to be open to, to thinking about lots of things. Uh, for one, even getting the diagnosis is difficult. I wasn't told in the ER that I had a concussion. I had soft tissue in injury on the imaging, yes. imaging, and that's all that they told me. So had I not had that connection of working in neurology as long as I had and knowing people, I wouldn't have gotten evaluated even right away right. because I didn't know what issues I had. But then I thought, you know, maybe I did end up with a concussion. And I reached out to Dr. Bazakos, who's my neurologist, and he's like, yeah, sure, absolutely. Come on in. He squeezed me in on a, on a lunch break. But just even getting that diagnosis wouldn't have happened if I didn't have those connections. So that's another, another big push that I have is if people don't have that, that, those connections, and most people don't. They wouldn't even get the diagnosis right, to begin right, with. Right. Which, so we need to be open for that and then open to all these other treatments that we can do because there's so much more that we can do than just PTOT speech. Yes. Yeah. Can yes. I ask, uh, sorry, I, I want to interject. I want to ask more questions because I don't, we haven't gotten to the point where we actually talk about, and you probably know, but I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure about how you sustained your injury. I didn't hear an accident, but did we talk about, the so the viewers accident. know, because I have a feeling that a lot of people this is going to be like a light bulb moment for them when they actually see this. They're like, oh my gosh, this happened to me. Maybe that's why this happened and maybe that's why that happened. So please, if you don't mind sharing how yeah, you actually. Yeah. Uh, so sustained. my husband and I were driving to dinner one mm -hmm. night and we got going late. It was getting darker, kind of dusk time, mm -hmm. time frame. We went through uh, an intersection. We sat at the red light for a little bit and then turned. It ended up that the straight light turned green and our turn light was not green yet, but there was one car coming from the other direction. He was far enough away. You can see forever at that intersection. As we were turning, we realized that he was not stopping. Mm -hmm. So no horn, no brakes, no swerving, no nothing, just crashed and sliced off the front of our vehicle. Wow. They suspected he was going somewhere between 70, 75 miles an hour wow. in a 55 zone. So yeah. neither one of us were in the right. Um, it was definitely an accident by all terms of an accident, but, uh, me being in the passenger seat, my husband's head was stopped by all the airbags. All the airbags went off. There's no airbag in the center of the vehicle. So there was nothing to stop my head moving back and forth. That way. Uh, so I actually didn't hit my head. And this is the, the other interesting part of it is mm -hmm. that I didn't hit my head to get, yeah. the, get the concussion, the traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. It was just the force of my brain inside of the skull moving around from the, in neurology, we call right. it the coup, counter coup injury, right? Yeah. So would this be more of a... a, a a whiplash is whiplash only back and forth, or can it be side to side as well? This it can is be not side to side as well. Yep, I had whiplash and I had the the TBI. Okay, so it's both. Okay, and and thanks for saying that because mm -hmm. I know as a massage therapist who has treated countless people for whiplash, post car accident, and concussion, you're absolutely right. People don't realize, and you've said it th many times throughout this interview that you don't necessarily look like that anything's wrong, and you can cover up and you. And so if you don't yeah. look the part, you're not getting paid attention to. And I've certainly seen from a soft tissue perspective that something wasn't right, that it was more than just soft tissue and that that precious brain of ours and brain health needs to be um, addressed. And so thanks for sharing that because I know it can be very traumatic. Um, and for those listening at home, know that, you know, you really can have things happen to your brain without even realizing it. It doesn't have to be that dramatic event like even a car accident. Um, but listen to your body and those symptoms. And then, as Mandy will say, what is your next biggest message is about advocacy for the patient, correct? Yes, you have to advocate for yourself, but you also have to have a trusted person that can be with you. Because as I mentioned, when I went to my appointments, I couldn't always 
tell them what was wrong. I didn't know that all of the things that I had that were going on could be related to my head injury. And to be honest, I didn't even, even recognize that all these things were happening at first. When I went to see Dr. Bazakis the first time, I didn't know that I had double vision. I didn't know that my balance was off. And he saw it all on exam and asked me if I was aware. And I said, nope, I had no idea. So a trained person with all the experience that I have, I didn't even recognize my symptoms. So it's no wonder other people don't recognize their symptoms either. And they just try to go about their day. I've talked to so many people who've gone back to work and then they had issues. They couldn't stay at their jobs because of all these, these things that were wrong with them, but they didn't know that it was concussion related. And so just getting to that point is huge <laughs> for, for one on that. Um, and then well, I do forget for sharing. Oh, that's, that's okay. all right. That's okay. <laughs> it's good for us to interject. Cause we're going to take a break here in a minute. And when we get back, in the third segment, we're going to really dive into that layering of tools. What's in Mandy's toolbox? What can we put into your toolbox? And how can we help you take better care of your brain and mental health? Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned. We'll be right back here at Fancast. 